And we're moving into, according to my notes, section three. <clears throat> we're going to get into um, a little more technical realities pertaining to the gospel. And for all of you on Skype, those of you who may not have been <clears throat> with us, we've been uh, studying the gospels. This is class number seven. Um, but we took the first portion to sort of just go through and really, really look at a bunch of the <coughs> major points of the gospel, only to find out that the gospel wasn't presenting the gospel, not not in the way that we the way we understand the gospel, <coughs> anyway. Um, and there was some allusions uh, alluding to it, but it was not. Um, expounded upon by Jesus or anyone else. And so we moved into the next phase, which was to realize that the purpose of the gospel, gospels is not to declare the gospel, but the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and we have sort of started um, in that arena, explaining that and going through scriptures, and we'll do, we'll do that a lot here. But the next section after this one, we really just flat start going over, I mean, scripture by scripture, just showing it over and over and over in the Gospels that that is its purpose. <clears throat> All right. So uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? <clears throat> so usually pretty early in, in a person's conversion and once they've come to the Lord, um, they begin to be, you know, presented with a concept, Jesus is Lord. I mean, that's real popular in certain um, denominations and areas. Uh, there are people that will get up in front of the church almost every Sunday and go, Jesus is Lord, and everybody just starts shouting like they never heard that before. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, you, you've never heard that. <laughs> you know? um, and... Um, uh, the, the question, some, well, let me just read a little bit here. But the question sometimes arises as to how one goes about establishing him as Lord over their life. We're familiar with the thought that when we came to Christ, we changed lords. I think, I think most of us are familiar with that concept. Uh, that concept as it stands has the possibility of becoming spiritually vague not having any real practicality to it for our lives. And I'm convinced that the whole purpose of the kingdom of God, well, of course, we, we talked about this a lot last class, that the kingdom come in earth, not just on earth, but in earth as it is, as it is. <clears throat> and so a kingdom teaching that has absolutely no practicality is ridiculous. Now, that's my opinion. We all know that I'm a great scholar. <laughs> so uh, you do not necessarily need to heed my opinions on anything. Um, but as I see it, um, the purpose of the kingdom is to bring something heavenly into the earth. You know? <clears throat> so that's where I came up with that weird idea that it should be practical and real in our lives. Um, therefore, perhaps it can be better said by stating that we have changed kingdoms. And yet, that still, to me, doesn't really say it until we say it, we have changed dominions, or we have changed what has dominion over us to something else that has dominion over us. Now, that's getting real. That's getting down to daily life and how we proceed. <clears throat> um, so what once dominated us no longer does or shouldn't. And that's, you know, salvation doesn't remedy that. I mean, just the act of salvation. Think about it. Every one of you, when you first got saved, were you instantly changed in every way? Let me just ask you this. Are you changed in every way right now? then what is wrong with you people? <laughs> Just kidding. <clears throat> um, 
but it is a process of growing into the reality of Christ as life and therefore Christ as government within us. That's what we're talking about, the government of Christ's nature within us. Um, so the old dominions of being in bondage to sin, to the flesh, to the world, to the devil, to selfishness have ended. Now, I say that because they ended at the cross. They, those, those dominions may not have ended in your life, but I can assure you that every one of these, uh, if you go over them, um, you know, he that is dead is freed from sin. There's where it ended. Okay, uh, what was the other one? Uh, the flesh. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the lusts and the affections. I mean, there's, there's that. I don't even have these in my notes. I'm just uh, crucified to the world. Uh, that's Galatians 6, 14. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, it says that we are crucified unto the world and the world crucified unto us and the devil. Hebrews 2, 14. Uh, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. In every one of those cases, the answer is the cross. I mean, interestingly enough, it is not just salvation that did it. Now, you know, I probably shouldn't say, you know, stuff off the top of my head. That's one good reason to stick with notes. But, you know, salvation, as explained by most people, literally, yeah, so here I go. <laughs> so literally, it sort of circumvents everything at the cross and doesn't really, even, I mean, it doesn't circumvent forgiveness, but it circumvents being dead to sin. Well, wait a minute. You, you hardly hear anything about being dead to sin, but thank God you can keep sinning, but there's forgiveness. You see what I'm saying? I mean, and, and, um, and that's okay for people who really just want to keep sinning. You know, it's a great formula for that, but for people that really want the Lord and they find themselves continuing to sin and go just get forgiveness, you know, that's, that, that's sort of where the altar call was invented. It's a, it's a, It's an altar-like thing where you go, but you don't die. <laughs> you get forgiveness or you get blessed, which is absolutely ridiculous. The altar representing the old covenant, you never went down there to get blessed. You knew something was going to die, you know. <clears throat> and so... Um, so when I, when I refer to salvation, uh, <clears throat> not doing everything, I'm talking about the, the initial act of getting saved, but tr a true understanding of salvation has to include all of the elements of what the Word of God presents to us. We may not do that. Preachers may not do that. They may reduce it down to, oh, just pray you're saved, and that's all that's important. The whole point was just to keep you out of hell. But that's not true. And I'm not saying preachers, when they tell you that, are liars. I'm not. I'm not saying that. God is. No, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm not. I'm messing with you again. I'm, I'm just saying that there is this reality that there's so much more and we're not even made aware of it most of the time. And so what, what happens usually? We end up struggling. We end up failing God. We end up, you know, brokenhearted. I mean, I remember a certain point in my life of going down, constantly going down to the altar, de rededicating myself, going down to the altar, rededicating myself. And at one time just thinking, you know, just being moved by the Spirit and thinking, you know, I need to go down to the altar and I am just, pitiful is what I was thinking, you know. I go down to the altar every time. You know, I remember thinking, you know, there's not too many people who are always down there with me, you know. And my conclusion was, I just must be a horrible person, you know. I sin all the time. And, you know, we think that. We think everybody around us is doing so good, you know. Oh, I'm not worthy of being around these holy people. Oh, boy. 
you know. <laughs> the only real holy ones are on Skype, you know. <clears throat> well, I have a list right here. Let's see how they measure up. Never mind. <laughs> we all need Jesus. Can you get can you say amen to that? I mean, we all need Jesus. And the good the good news is is that we all really want Jesus. And we all are not satisfied with just nominal teaching. We it's like that 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 woman woman with the issue of blood and all the people are crowded around Jesus and I used this last time but a little different feel to it. And she is pressing her way through the crowd trying to get to the real Jesus, not just happy to know he passed, you know, oh, Jesus passed by. You know, there's even songs, there's old, old songs that used to say Jesus passed by, and, you know, they're talking about the glory. Well, you know, how about Jesus being right now, right here? <clears throat> anyway, I'm sorry I'm getting a little stirred up so early. <clears throat> okay, now... <laughs> Now Christ rules us, not just as an overlord from a throne in heaven, but as the life and nature from within. Now, you, you, know, you, you do understand that a lot of people, when they talk about the kingdom or their understanding of the kingdom, and we dealt with this last couple of classes, they put it far away into the future. And they do that because if Jesus is not ruling in them right now, it doesn't feel like he's ruling at all. I mean, he's going to rule. Does that make sense? Like he's going to, but he clearly isn't because look at us, sort of, <laughs> which is, you know. Um, but they, the, the reason why they put that off isn't always heresy or error or anything like that. Sometimes it is because they have not really come to the realization that God wants, that, that Christ's rule is supposed to be in us by his spirit and by his nature. And if they don't know that, then they're wondering what's going on. And so they put it off and say it's got to go. Yes. Right. What's done and what's what's already settled, and then we we it's like it's like when God said the land is all yours, we have to enter into it and we have to take it, but it is already settled with God. God said it's yours. He didn't say I'll give it to you alone. He did say I give it to you, but He also said, for I have given it unto you, and and it is a process, and and uh, the pro that's why the Holy Spirit is still here, folks. Anybody realize that? You know what I mean? Why leave? You know. I mean, think about it. Why leave one of the, the persons of the Godhead still down here? He's going, what, what did I do? You know? <laughs> the other two are up there in glory. And I'm stuck with these people. You know? <laughs> All right. So um, my next subtopic is, and, I, and I'd really like for you to consider this in a right way, and I'll, I'll try to read so that I can get my point across. But it's called a new kind of bondage. Okay? Okay. No, I want you to get past your little wah wah, you know, <laughs> you know, and just realize that coming under Jesus' authority could be considered a bondage. Do you, you, do you realize that marriage could be considered a bondage? Some people. <laughs> You know, the bad thing is, it came from all the married people on this side. <laughs> you know, it, it's, um, uh, what do you, social bondage, I guess is one way of putting it. I don't know, I'm, I'm digging for words here. But it is, you know, and it, it, and here's what I mean by bondage, in that you are bound to them. You know? You're bound to that person, at least you said you were, <laughs> you, know? you know. And so that's, that's where I'd like to come from with this, is to realize, um, is to realize 
that Jesus didn't just set you free to do anything you want. He set you free from all of those other lords to be under his lordship. Can I get amen on that? Come on. <clears throat> now, when we say that, though, we're not talking about being under the lordship of Christ, the religious Jesus that most people think is sitting so far away on a throne and he's looking and watching. And if you mess up, he's going to get you or whatever. Carolyn said it good, well, a while ago. She said that, that we're already one with him. All of those things are already there. So our failures are only failures to grasp what is true, not to measure up. Not to measure up. It's not about measuring up. It's about coming into the fullness of the Christ that we have been joined to and let, letting him do it, letting his mind be in you. Let, that, that word let is used a lot in the New Testament. Let. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a yielding to his spirit, to his nature. All right, so here we go, a new kind of bondage. You're a little more prepared to hear it without going, nah. It's funny that you would go like this, but that's the very thing I'm putting back on you, <laughs> making that little, that little cross. Okay, so then to accept Jesus as Lord involves more uh, it involves being made free from certain externals as well as internal things along with coming into servanthood to Jesus. Set free from certain externals and internal things. Coming into servanthood to Jesus. And when we say servanthood to Jesus, again, the Jesus you need to be obeying is the life of Christ within you if you, if you understand that. Now, if there are commands in the word, and I'll just say it like that, we, we make that everything, So this is, I, but I have to say it. He, he can sit on a throne and say, I want the church to, I want this church to, you know, shut this facility down and start meeting in the park. Okay, that may not come from within as it were. You understand what I'm saying? But things of nature things of, you know, love and, you know, of, of patience and whatever. You know, you understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> All right, yes, by Jesus we are made free, but at the same time we come into a new kind of bondage. We must recognize that we do not leave an old kingdom simply to come into freedom from all lords, but to actually enter a new rule run by a new ruler. Make sense? We have been delivered from the power and, well, you know, that's over. I just quote scripture a lot of times. Colossians chapter 1. And this goes right along with what Carolyn was saying and what we've been saying also. Colossians chapter 1. In verse 13, <clears throat> who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. All right, lots of good stuff there. Just one simple little verse, but incredible. I mean, this, the second word will, will get you, who hath. I don't know what your translation is. Mine's King James. And uh, hath is past tense. He's already done. He hath delivered us. Well, that's, that would be a revelation to a whole lot of Christians and a whole lot of denominations that we're already delivered. He hath delivered us. They're going, oh, Lord, deliver me. You know, oh, Lord. you know, they're trying to, you know, it's like the cross wasn't good enough. And they would never say that. You know what I mean? They're crying out for deliverance. So, oh, Lord, the cross wasn't good enough. It, it, didn't, do, it didn't do what I need. But this says, he hath delivered us. Okay. Delivered, past tense. He hath delivered us. Okay. He hath delivered us from the power of darkness. All right. It did not say he hath delivered us from the presence of darkness. 
delivered us from the power of darkness. Somebody says, well, the devil's running rampant in my community. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> What'd you say? He's running rampant in your home? <laughs> you know, we got to get Mike back in here so I can pick on him, you know. <laughs> All right. Okay. As long as you're willing to take the lashes, sister. <laughs> but this says, he hath delivered us from the power of darkness. And yet, you, you see the activity of the enemy all around. His presence might even be there. But it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a pit bulldog that, that someone has pulled all of its teeth out. And he attacks you and gums your toes. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're going, you know, but at first you see him, you go, you know, you come, and you go, oh my God, you know what I mean? <laughs> you're just kind of, you know, you're going, Thank you, Jesus. You know, num -num -num. <laughs> well, for a lot of us, we don't realize that deliverance. For example, and um, you know, well, I just need to read, but I just have to, you know, follow what I, I'm sensing here. For example, David and Goliath. You know, number one, <clears throat> the before David shows up, all of the all of Israel. All of Israel. And David's a 16-year-old boy. His older brothers are there. They're all, you know, you know, scared of Goliath. And Goliath comes out for 40 days and says, Give me a man to fight. And, uh, you know, we will fight. And if he, if he defeats me, then all of us will be subservient to you. But if, but if I defeat him, all of Israel will serve me. Will serve the Philistines. And all of the men of war are going, oh, oh no, you know, God help us, we need deliverance, you know. And they're, and they're just, it's like the, the giant comes out and just insults them and makes them feel like idiots and small and stupid. And, Lord, you know, why don't you do something? David comes up, David goes, What's this uh, uncircumcised Philistine doing on God's land here? That's, uh, God already said that they'd be driven out and they have no right here. So the thing is already done in God's heart. All I have to do is step out in faith and, and not just in faith the way we think, but how about step out in the reality that God holds, we call it faith, siding with God, seeing with God and realizing this guy has absolutely no legal right here. And if I believe that we've already been delivered from that, the physical manifestation of this is going to be dealt with. Okay? So he goes out and he takes a rod. Just one stone. Bam. He's down. Folks, that wasn't all, all glory to David. You know? That was David who had done what the rest of them hadn't done. He had spent time with God apart from war, meaning what we're going through. Hello? <laughs> you know, oh, I come to God when I got trouble, but when I don't, I don't even think of him. Yeah, well, David did, you know. And David's just tending the sheep. And that's another thing. See, he says, I'm tending the sheep of my father. And so when, when he became, you know, a, a, a warrior there, he was still tending the sheep of his father. But he's tending the sheep. Of the, and he's thinking about feeding them. And he's thinking about, you know, leading them and all this kind of stuff. And when a bear comes out, he goes, hey, man, <laughs> you know, this, these ain't my sheep. You know, I know that sounds like a great story, but you know, sometimes, sometimes as a minister, I get in a situation, I'm going, oh, Lord, I just, 
You know, I mean, I may, let's just try to draw a couple of pictures. I may just feel really bad and didn't get time in the word and didn't get to be able to be with the Lord the way I wanted to. And so, I, I, you know, I'm praying and I just say, Lord, these are not my people, they are your people, and you love them, and you want to feed them, and Jesus, you are the good shepherd. So I'm not looking to me, not my strength, not my ability, not my time. I look to you because of the way you are towards them, your heart, and I'm trusting you to come out of it. And he, he does. And that's just one example of trying to, trying to make it practical um, of so many, so many, I mean, I've been to places where, you know, I don't know, um, you know, maybe foreign country and something, and you're just wondering, you know, how do I relate to these people? How do I, you know, I mean, you get a little nervous because you, you're not sure, you know, you want to bless, <laughs> you know, you want to be a blessing, but you know, you realize that there's so many differences here, and Lord, I, just, I, you know, you love them, and you want to feed them. Okay, well, that's an example. David's going, look, this is your sheep, these people, when, with David and Goliath, or sitting out there with those sheep, saying, this is my father's sheep, bear comes out, kills it, okay? He continues to not just tend the sheep, but he's spending time with the Lord. All, he, it's like it's it's like it's what he wants to do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean la 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 not ever not we're not always in that heart and we need to have that as our heart. God said of David, he's a man after my heart. He didn't say he had a good heart, he said he's a man after my heart. You know. And when you're after the heart of the Lord, you want the Lord, and so you, you're grabbing, you're grabbing moments. So if you have to work and you work hard, and it demands that you give full concentration and stuff, and but you get a few minutes, you walk your car, you're going to get something or, or whatever. Maybe you just, you know, you, you it's lunch or whatever. You you pull out your Bible and say, Lord, you can do more in five minutes than I can do in ten years. I my heart is with you in all of that. Uh, I can't. Search the word, I can't, but I want you to know that I want you, I desire you, I seek you. It's, but our hearts are stony. They're, it takes a while. It takes a saturation. It just, it just does. And soon we begin to melt. And we begin to find that, that that's not even us. That's the work of the Holy Spirit because we've, we've let him know that's what we wanted. So, you know, once the lion comes out, David has been with the Lord. The example I use is, you know, we talk about the full armor of God. And so the devil, we see the devil across the way, and yet we're not in the full armor. We're not, we don't have a shield of faith up. We've just been walking along as Christians on the earth, you know. La, la, la. Oh, praise the Lord, you know. And. You know, oh, I, let's pray over the food. Lord, bless the food. Amen. You know, you see what I'm saying? There's no shield of faith going on there. There's no real connection with the Lord. And so we see the enemy, and then, you know, here comes the fiery dart. Pew, pew, pew. And they hit us before we can even think, hmm, I think I need a shield of faith. You know what I mean? And then we go, oh. So we're taking the shield of faith and going, trying to put out the fire. You know? And that's too late. That's too late. They've already hit you, man. And those fiery darts, when they get in you, all right, it's like poison. Now you're going to have some problems, you know. So, <clears throat> so there's something to be said of just maintaining. Not highs and not lows. Maintaining an equilibrium in your walk with the Lord where you just you just want you want the Lord you don't have to you know you don't have to be a crazed maniac it's not what I'm talking it's not ah, I got a Jesus you know it's like could you go join another church please 
you know. <laughs> there, you know, I mean, you don't get that from Jesus, you know, when he's walking with the Father. And he goes, well, you know, um, what was it? The disciples said, you know, came up on him and said, you're alone. He said, I'm not alone. My Father is with me. You know, it's like, I'm never really alone. I am never alone, you know. And, and you find a steadiness, a steadiness. And it doesn't have to be flashy. It just has to be steady, you know. <clears throat> All right. And then the last part of this verse, verse 12, Colossians 1, says, uh, we've been around the world with scripture since this, but he... Um, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay. Um, and that's the, my margin says, into the kingdom of the son of his love. Okay. Uh, we weren't translated to an official kingdomality. I don't really know how to say it. I'm sure it's not even a word. We weren't translated to some sort of a, a um, um, local kingdomality. We were translated into the kingdom of the Son of the Father's love. This is, this is trying to express a whole lot more than you, now you're in the kingdom of God. You see, it's, you, we're not just supposed to say, oh, now I'm in the kingdomality. Right well, now I'm in the kingdom. You know, oh, thank God. No, we're in the kingdom of his son. And not just his son, the son that he loves. And it's not the kingdom of, the, of loving the sinners that are now saved. You're saved. You were a sinner, but you're not a sinner anymore. Once you're in Christ, you're a saint and you're one with Jesus and Jesus is the one. You're not the one. I'm not the one. Now, I remember when I was in Bible school and I heard stuff like that and I remember certain students go, well, that ain't any good, you know. It's like, okay, Jesus, um, somebody once said, you know, Jesus doesn't, love you he loves his son and i remember them going Dad, that's not so the way it's supposed to be jesus loves me but i understood what they meant and i understand it now but even when they said it back then for me a reject from oak cliff an orphan an outcast the fact that, I mean, the picture that was in my, where's my job? The picture that was in my mind was, here's the father, and here's the son, here's the son of his love, and I'm in here, I'm wrapped in here, though. I'm in son, but I'm wrapped in him. I'm in that son, but I'm wrapped in him. And here's the love of the father to the son of his love. And I'm in there when, you know, the picture I always get is that when I see the father hugging Jesus, I'm in there. I'm in Jesus. And I'm getting, oh, I feel you, father. You know what I mean? But he's not really hugging me. He's hugging Christ. But it is me in the sense that I'm one with him. And I... That upset people, but it didn't bother me at all. I thought, man, I can use some of that, you know, that it not be about me. It felt right to me. It felt good. I didn't, I was so sick of me, I was just, let, just let it all be Jesus. Well, guess what it is. Christ is all and in all. Okay. So, well, we're not supposed to take that literally. Oh, really? You know? Well, which parts do we take? <laughs> anyway, that's, a, that's another deal. All right, so. Um, we, have, uh, we have been delivered from the power and rule 
of darkness, yet at the same time we've been translated into another kingdom with another ruler. You see that scripture, what it's saying? It didn't just say, you've been delivered from the enemy, go play little puppies. You know, I mean, that's kind of, I know people that think like that, oh, I'm free, you know, I can violate everybody and, you know, yeah, <clears throat> or gum to death by a toothless <laughs> pit bull. <clears throat> um, okay, let's look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I know I have a 1 Corinthians in my Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 22. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 22. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Verse, next verse, you're bought with a price. Be not ye servants of men. All right. <clears throat> so it's saying that, it, that you have become the Lord's servant. But again, because you have been bought by the cross, not just freed by the cross. Does that make sense? Okay. And <clears throat> let's just look at it like this too. When Adam fell and the nature of the old nature and the old man was uh, released into everybody that's born into this earth, we were ruled, we were not free. You know, we say we were free, you know. I mean, I always, uh, I remember when I first got born again, and I remember seeing how the devil worked with a lot of my friends and stuff because I, I was hippie and ran around with people that did drugs and stuff like that. And I remember seeing people that I loved go, you know, uh, this, this stuff is really good, but it's getting boring. I think I'm going to try so-and-so. And it was harder. And I went, oh, my God, oh, my God, no, you know. And, and the guys that I had any say into their life, I told them, you know, even before I came to the Lord, I said, no needles, no heroin, no, none of that stuff, you know. <clears throat> um, and I watched the devil kind of, it was almost like you could see it, like it was a movie. You'd watch the devil and he'd go, here, try this sweet little stuff right here, and you know, you go, or whatever, you know. And then they would... Then they would move from, from that, and then the devil go, oh, here, try something else. And you go, I'm free. I, I'm, I, I can do whatever I want. And pretty soon it's shooting up needles. And go, I got to have, have this, you know, and I don't have any money, and I'm going to have to go break into cars or people's houses and da-da-da-da. Oh, my God. It's like you, you know, the, the devil says, here, here, it's like a carrot dangling out. Oh, da -da -da, until you're in his trap. <clears throat> Well, people weren't free. They thought they were free, but they weren't free. And with time, bondage began to really manifest itself. That's why a whole lot of people come to the Lord, because they realize that. All right. But then many of those people are taught, okay, now that you've come to Jesus, you're free, and they become free from Jesus as Lord. They still honor him as Savior. But whatever he says, they don't take that, you know, and it's bigger than that because it's not just his words. It's his spirit and his nature. All right. So 1 Corinthians 7, 22 and 23 describe this dichotomy well when it declares that we're the Lord's free man from the old and the Lord's bondman to the reign of the new king and to his life within. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Romans 6 is a really good place that, that starts talking about this stuff. Romans 6 and verse 15, starting with verse 15. <clears throat> really, this whole thing goes to the end of the chapter. 
Um, let's just read it. What then, what then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Okay, now I don't have the time to explain it now, but I did in one of my newsletters and, and spent months putting showing New Testament obedience. Anybody remember that? Okay, New Testament obedience. And really, really, I use these scriptures, but I used a whole lot of them to show that New Testament obedience isn't the same as Old Testament obedience. It's not. It's not the same. Old Testament obedience was, uh, you, I come back to this, you write the commandment on the wall and then you do it, you know. You, you obey. But it's described here a lot by using, again, that word yield. Yield. And that's what you do with the nature of Christ. The obedience is just simply yielding to his nature. And it, it, des it describes that. And again, I'm not going to try to teach that whole teaching again. But if you're interested in whatever, I can probably find a copy of it somewhere. Um, <clears throat> verse 17 but God be thanked that whereas you were the servants of sin you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you so this is an obedience from the heart not just the will okay verse 18 being then made free from sin you become the servants of righteousness you see that I mean there's a there's still a kingdom involved, is what I'm trying to say. And, and more importantly, just to make it clear, there's still a king involved. Okay. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. For, and, of course, the word holiness doesn't mean absolute purity. And everyone says it does, other than people who know the true meaning. It, it means being separated unto the Lord. All of the items that were in the tabernacle were, were deemed holy because they were separated to his purposes. Okay? That's... Um, <clears throat> verse 20... For when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Amen? What fruit had ye then in those things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God. <laughs> Do you see that little statement? And now being made free from sins, you're servants to God. But it's a different kind of rule. And it's a different kind of spirit. Service to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Okay, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life without beginning and without end, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Not just that you're going to live for a long, long time now, you know. I mean, people, people say, oh, I have eternal life. And I say, well, what does that mean to you? He says, well, you know, I got saved, and I'm going to live, you know, now I'm going to live forever. Well, I got news. If you never got saved, you're still going to live forever. Yeah. just depends on where you're going to live it at. You know what I mean? Eternal life is without beginning and without end, and that's Christ. Eternal life is without beginning and without end, and that's Christ. <clears throat> All right. Uh, for the wages of sin is death. You know the wages of sin are down 3% this year. This would be the year. If you're going to sin, this would be the year. <clears throat> Sorry. 
All right. Romans 6, 15 through 23 gives us a look at the new dominion that is now over us. In this chapter of Romans, we begin to find answers to our question concerning how lordship is brought about. For example, what is the key that unlocked the chain that held us to the old dominion? The answer comes in Paul's words that say, you are dead to sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. That's verse 11 of the same chapter. You are dead to sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Okay, you're dead to, to and here's, here's what I'm trying to paint by even bringing this up. You are dead to sin nature. You're not just dead to sinning, you're dead to sin nature, but you're not alive unto God through not sin nature, <laughs> not sinning nature, or whatever. Help me out, you know, a good nature. You're alive unto God through Jesus Christ. It's not, a, it's not a good nature. It's not a godly nature in that sense. It is Christ. Yes, it is. if it's a divine nature, it's Christ. It's not us. You know, I mean, Peter says that. We've been partakers of the divine nature. Well, does that mean that we're divinity now? Does that mean that we're, we've somehow been made gods? Some people teach that, and they'd be wrong. <laughs> uh, clearly, you know, I don't know about other churches, but clearly I can tell we're not gods around here. Okay? <clears throat> no problem with that one here. But the, the, the divine nature, therefore, screams it's Christ in us. But that's the only place it uses divine nature. Like this one right here, it really, if you really hear it, you go, oh my God, do you hear what this is saying? This is, this is making it not, you know, and Romans 5 did this too, not as Adam, da da da, da so also is Christ. You ever look at that? Romans 5, where he's saying, you know, the, as by one man's sin, death came, but by one man's obedience, Righteousness came, and, and then it, but he, he uses terminology like, but not as Adam, so also is Christ. Meaning, it's the same in that it is a nature, but it's not the same in that that was just a nature, and this is Christ in you. The honor goes to the person, and we are his body, and that nature flows through every part and fills every part. He says, the, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Say, all right. So, and, I, and the one reason why I'm emphasizing that is to help us to realize what, um, what is the focus of our search? What is the, what is the direction in which we center in. Where should our compass point? Our compass should always point to Christ. He is, I am the way. I'm not, so if he said I am the way, I'm not going to go, well, help me find it, you know, and go looking somewhere else, you know. I am the truth. Well, I've got to get in here and learn the truth. No, you can learn truths, but those truths need to lead you to him who is the truth because he's the life of that. He's the life of that. I was seeing that kind of in relationship to the Father's house. <clears throat> that in the Father's house, there was plenty, like the prodigal son. There's, there's all this plenty, and there's the Father, and there's this... this, this um, Community is not the right word, but this environment, environment of what he is. What he is, eternal, what he is. Well, the son doesn't, doesn't grasp the, the father nor the fullness of what is by being in. And so he says, oh, well, give me subjects. Give me pieces of this and let me separate it from you, Father, and let me separate it from 
that reality, take it outside of being in Christ. Let me just make it a Christian thing and let me pile uh, doctrine upon doctrine and subject upon subject and search it. So he does. He separates from the, the heartbeat and the livingness of it and he goes out on his own and he goes out and pretty soon man he's hungry and he's empty and he's hurting and he's in a hog pen and and so um, his his thought is you know he, you know he, it says he comes to himself <laughs> he goes you know this is really stupid. In my father's house, there's none of this. Okay. So in that hog pen, he does, the father doesn't go, oh, well, let me pick up some of the pieces of the environment, of the, of the eternalness. You know, let me take a chunk of this and a chunk of that, and let me run out and go to the hog pen and go... Oh, my son, I love you here. Here's the, because he'd be doing the same thing the, fa the son did. Dividing it out, taking it apart, and taking it out of Christ. And making it something that's not Christ, but given of Christ. Yes. Are you following me? <laughs> I hope, hope you are. I'm just off on this but I mean I you know I was just just recently I was just seeing this but so the father waits and he's still within his realm and he's waiting for the son and the son all he can think of because he's been out there so long and finding these things weren't working these these implements of Christianity because Christianity doesn't work without Christ as I said or it's just anity you take Christ out of anything. It's, it's dead. You've robbed it of everything that will work. Okay, so the son doesn't fully realize this. <clears throat> so he's thinking, oh, you know what? I am empty and I messed up and I got to get back to the father's house and find a remedy for emptiness and darkness and failure and all of that stuff he never experienced in the father's house. You know, because there Christ is all and in all. So he comes back to the father and goes, oh, you know, and he's getting ready to give his spiel. You know, I'm not worthy. That's what he said in his mind, you know, coming back. Well, I'm going to tell the father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Dummy, you never were worthy. It's not about your worthiness. It's about the father putting you in son, you know, and that's all that counts to the father. He, he didn't get all, he didn't go, you need to repent now, boy. You need to fall on your knees and you need to cry and you need to convince me that you're sorry. The, to the Father, outside of Christ, you're dead. Inside of him, you're alive. You know? So he comes and he's got a sob story of, of needing remedy instead of needing Christ. Christ. I don't know if you can see the difference, but in the Father's heart, Jesus is not remedy. He's just answer. Amen. Not to, to in, not to anything. He's just answer to the Father. This is it. He's just answer. We say the answer is, we use it, you know, like we would use the word remedy. And so we say, well, oh, he remedied my darkness. No, he filled you with Christ. He remedied my emptiness. No, he filled you with Christ. Do you see the difference? It's the same thing. The result is the same, but the motive of the Father is different. He wants you in Christ and Christ in you. All right. So the son gets back and goes, oh, I'm not worthy and all this. and I'm really bad. And while he's talking, you know, the Father goes, you know, puts this ring on his finger. And you know, back then it was a signet ring that represented the fullness of the house that you could, you could, you know. Uh, anyway, so you know, I just, I'm not worthy. Oh, man. You know, I'm just in there and puts this robe, you know, clothes him and everything, puts shoes on him and everything. And I'm just, uh, what the heck is going on here? You know, I'll tell you what the heck is going on there, prodigal boy. 
you need to get your mind renewed to the father's view of his son and you with his son and in his son. You need to. So it's like he's going, he's looking at the, you know, but he's looking at the father's face and the father is, is just, thank you. And the father is just like, you know, yeah, and he's putting all this on and he's dressing him and he's taking care and he's just, he's treating him like he's the best son that ever was because Jesus is the best son he ever was and that's who's in us and that's who he sees us in. And so he's treating us like that and pretty soon the father keeps watching his face and looking at his face and going, you know what? This guy is not upset over all that stuff. This guy is happy that I'm back here and I think I'm gonna go with him. And so he takes him over the fatted calf, he killed the fatted calf, let's have a big party. And he's going, you know what? I am not gonna sit here and act like I'm just messed up. He's not, I'm gonna get with him. Do you know what confession means? The Greek, it's two Greek words, say with. Say what God says, say with him. We think, you know, I'm going to confess my sin. How about confessing Jesus is Lord? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, that I, he's, I'm under his government and he protects that and all of it. And he died to, to protect it and to, and to maintain it in the, in the way the Father wanted it. And so, so when he sits down there to, to feast on the fatted calf, the Father's just like overjoyed and the Son is just like, man. Yeah, you know, and they're just, they're just enjoying the communion of what the Father, how the Father sees him and how the Father understands the thing. And, and he's back in that environment, back in Christ. He's not using Christ as a remedy for anything. Jesus automatically chases off darkness. He doesn't have to remedy darkness. He just has to be. Does that make sense? I mean... I'm telling you that there is so much to this and um, this reality of getting out of the failures and getting out of all of that and letting him rule as life in us and it letting, their, letting us decrease and Christ increase. And with that comes, like I said, once you get in the, the house, once you get in the Father's house, there's no emptiness, there's no lack, there's no darkness, there's no hogs, there's no, you know, all this stuff. You go, you know, you don't have to fight all that stuff. His being, and, and because of the cross, because of Christ crucified, he dealt with that. But your emphasis has to be seeking Christ and not remedy and not your, fixing yourself. There is no hope for you apart from Christ. There's not. That's why we come to him one of the reasons anyway we're out of time well that was enough for three sessions so this is the last one. not really we'll come back take a break and we'll come back